You brought a Bible? All right. I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Genesis. We are in chapter 44 today. Now, you know, our Wednesday night crowd would never believe that we're covering entire chapters in one Sunday morning. They just, they just wouldn't believe that that's even possible. But we're doing it uh, and uh, gleaning from the life of Joseph and, and this. There's a lot to glean from here, to be sure. You know, last week when... When chapter 43 ended, all of the brothers were sitting together. They were eating in Joseph's house. Of course, they didn't know it was Joseph's house. They just knew it was the big head honcho there. They were eating in his house. They were talking. They were laughing. Everything seemed like it was right with the world. As they sat and and talked and ate and ate and ate, all of their worries at least for the time being, had just dissipated. Because, you know, they were were very concerned when they went back to Egypt for the second time, not only to ask for more food, but now they had to bring their younger brother with them, and they still had to try and rescue their their brother Simeon, who was being held there. They had a lot of concerns. So they just didn't know what they might be facing, and and look, I mean, we saw last week what happened. Uh, before they left, their father had prayed in chapter 43 and verse, what verse was that? 13, he's uh, 14, 43, 14, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man. <laughs> he was talking about Joseph. He didn't know he was talking about his own son. That he may send away your other brother, And Benjamin, God Almighty, the Hebrew El Shaddai, the covenant God of Abraham, the all-sufficient one. This was Jacob's prayer before he sent his sons back to Egypt for their second trip. And you know his prayer was answered because they were receiving tremendous mercies here. Of course, they had another concern. They had to try and explain how they bought all of that food the first time and didn't pay any money for it. Because remember, when they they went back, they still had their money in their sacks. So now they had to try and prove we're not only not spies, but we're not thieves. And this is our younger brother. Don't keep him. And please let our older brother go. It's, you know, precarious situation. But here they are at the end of the chapter, verse 34. Verse 33 and 34, that's what they're doing. They're sitting before, I'm in chapter 43, by the way. And they're they're seated according to their birthright, the, the oldest to the youngest. They are marveling one at another. You know, the, the word marveled means they're, they're astonished. They're just mystified. They are dumbfounded. Or as one version translates it, they're amazed. How did this man know our birth order so he could see us all in our birth order? And they, he sent, the man, Joseph, of course, sent portions to them all. He fed them all well, but to Benjamin, five times as much as the rest. And they drank, and they were merry with him. They ate, they were feasting, and they were mystified. Let me tell you. This had to be one mystified group of men as they sit around and look at each other and they're trying to explain, how do we explain this turn of events? We, we came to plead for mercy. We're not thieves. We're not spies. And here we are ushered into the big man's house. He's treating us well. He's asking us about our family. He's feasting In our presence, they have to be mystified. And then the fact that they're all sitting in in their birth order, it's it's unexplainable. How, How can this be happening? How do you account for the dramatic change in the head man's attitude? Because, you know, when 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 we left, we were accused of being spies. And now he's sitting around with us like we're friends. How do we explain this change. Uh, well, 
Also, the fact that Benjamin got five times as much as the rest of them. You know, all of this was a test, right? It was all a test because Joseph is showing favoritism to Benjamin, just like his father had showed favoritism to him. He's going to measure to see if they show the same jealousy, envy, hate towards Benjamin that they had previously shown towards him. Y'all with me so far? He wanted to see if his brothers had changed in the 20 years that had passed. You know, sometimes people change for the better, sometimes for the worse. Sometimes they don't change at all. The same mean-spirited person that they were 20 years ago, they haven't changed one bit. You know, that's one of the things that I've seen through the years. Sometimes I'll bump into people I haven't seen in 20 years, 30 years, or 40. You know, I'm thinking about these graduates. And uh, and, and when I graduated, it's been 45 years ago when I graduated. I'll bump into people every now and then. And, you know, the same goofball they were. When I knew them, that's just how they are today. Now, most of them have changed. You know, age will do that to you. They'll make you realize you're not immortal, for one thing. You know, you're, you're not going to live forever. It makes you realize, whoa. <laughs> but some people are still just as goofy as they ever were. No sense then. You wonder how they even survive you know, sometimes. But one thing is for sure, Joseph... Joseph had changed. Dramatic changes in Joseph. I mean, he underwent a radical transformation in a number of ways. Twenty-something years has passed, so he's aged. He was a 17-year-old kid when his brothers saw him last. Now he's 40-ish. You know, there's change that takes place in that amount of time. His appearance changed. His status changed. His position changed. His power changed. His prominence changed. And you know, he matured a whole bunch because when they last saw him, he was this spoiled kid, probably spoiled, his daddy's favorite. And now he, where did he get these tremendous management skills, these people skills? Where did he, where did he develop all of this? Now he's presiding over all of Egypt, second in command of Pharaoh himself. You're talking dramatic changes in, in Joseph's life. Uh, this was not the same kid of 17 years of age, right? This is a different man. Uh, this is a man with power, but a man who could handle it. This was a man with influence. This was a man with prestige, but not a man full of self or pride. Jail had done a work on him. And all these false, false accusations had done a work on him. Servitude had done a work on him. You know, time allows us to grow and mature or, or not. I'll, I do know one thing that I think is definitely worth uh, our notice that reflects a dramatic change in Joseph's life. Uh, Joseph learned to speak with caution. Now, I want you to think about it. Because when he was young, everything that happened or came to his mind, he had to tell people. He had to tell his own brothers, hey, I had a dream. Hey, look at his coat. You don't have a coat like this. Now, maybe he never said that, but, you know, check out my coat. Dad gave it to me. Oh, oh, look, uh, you know, I had a dream and in the dream, we were all sheaves and my sheaf stood up. It, my sheaf stood up and all of your sheaves paid obeisance to my sheep. Now, you know what the Bible said? They hated him for that. Genesis 37, verse 5, Joseph dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. They hated him all the more for it, you know. When he saw his brothers and they were doing things they shouldn't have been doing, you know what he did? Well, we read that. He went and told his dad right away. He was action reporter. He was, he was new scene eight, you know, on the spot. Dad, let me tell you the latest report. Here's what they did. So he, he filled his dad in. Bible says they hated him for that. 
when he dreamed another dream, this time the sun, moon, and stars were giving obeisance to him. Like his dad, it's all the family, even his father rebuked him. And, uh, you know, here's my point in that, in saying that. Young Joseph did not have a filter on his mouth. I think we could say that. You know, some things you just, you don't have to tell everybody everything. You know that, right? Speaking the truth doesn't mean you have to say everything you think. Oh, well, I'm just telling them what I think. Well, some things you ought not to tell. Some things should be better kept to yourself. Just between you and the Lord, you, you, you hear something you don't like or somebody said something that rubbed you the wrong way. You don't have to tell them. You can be an overcomer. You can have a filter. <laughs> You know, as a young boy, he didn't have a filter on his mouth. And how much trouble did it cause? It stirred up constant trouble. In fact, Genesis 37, 8, they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. They hated him for his dreams and his words. You know what? Sometimes we just all need to know how to shut up. When to speak, when not to speak. You know Will Rogers? Remember him? The old uh, American satirist, humorist. He said, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. <laughs> well, well, you know what? How about Proverbs? Proverbs has a few things to say about that. Like Proverbs twenty-one, twenty-three: Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Yes. Or how about Proverbs 13.3? He that keeps his mouth keeps his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Or you could paraphrase that, shut up, live better. (laughs) One version translates that verse as Proverbs 13.3. He that guards his mouth guards his soul. One who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Hmm. Proverbs 18.7 A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. You know, sometimes people just can't keep their big mouth shut. And somebody will say something that's provocative. I mean, you know, it, it irritates them. Now, you know what you should do? You overcome. You die to self. You let that go. But they just can't do it. So they have to answer in kind. You know, sharp word for sharp word. And then you've got an explosion. What did you think was going to happen? When you told that person that and it caused a big uproar, what did you think was going to happen? You know, I couldn't help thinking about some weeks ago, somebody posted a YouTube video of a guy in Thailand who put his head in an alligator's mouth. So this was some kind of a a, a show. Apparently this guy did this on occasion. So people are standing around, you know, they get this big old alligator, they... Poke it with a stick, it opens its mouth, and he's going to tell her he sticks his, his head in the alligator's mouth, and it chomped on his head. And, and that's exactly what I said. What would you think was going to happen? You put your, your head in the alligator's mouth. What you think was going to happen? And yet, you know, here we are saying things with our mouth. When you say it, before you say it, Do you think it's going to minister peace? Grace? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But only that which is good for the use of edifying. Uh, I mean, what did you think was going to happen? You know, the ability to speak in many languages is valuable 
the ability to shut up in any language is priceless. You know? <laughs> well, look, here's the point. Old, the old Joseph, he just blurted out whatever came to his mind. If it comes to his mind, he thinks he should speak that. The mature Joseph, here we are 20-something years later. You know, he did not even reveal himself to his brothers. He had plenty of opportunity to do so, but he did not do it. There's wisdom. The ability to shut up. Know when to speak, know when not to speak. Well, he needed to know. He needed to know that they too had changed. He had changed, to be sure. He had changed. He had matured. And there were tests that were proving whether or not these men had changed as well. The test to see whether they'd be honest. The test to see what would their attitude be towards uh, their brother Benjamin. Will they still be petty? Will they still be envious? And he wanted to see how they'd act and react when he really turned up the heat which he was about to do right here in chapter 44. Are you there with me? In Genesis 44, all right. Here is the final exam. You see all of our graduates, they just did their final exams, passed, now they graduated. Well, Joseph is about to administer the final exam to his brothers. That's what's going on here in chapter 44. And he commanded, verse 1, the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry. Put every man's money in his sack's mouth. Specific, very specific instructions here. Load them up with all the food and grain they can carry. I mean, maximum capacity. Load those donkeys up. Put all their money back in their sacks. But verse 2, here's one more little bit of instruction. Put my cup, the silver cup, In the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money and the servant did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. So the caravan, verse three, gets underway. They get out and going at dawn's early light. Verse four, five, six, they were gone out of the city, not yet far off. Then Joseph said to his steward, get up, follow after the men. And when you overtake them, I want you to say to them, why have you rewarded evil for good? Is not this, is not this it in which my Lord drinketh and thereby indeed he divineth? You have done evil in so doing. He overtook them. He spoke to them these very words. Well, you know, the idea here is as soon as they got outside the city limits, he sent his steward to go intercept them charged them with a very serious crime. The crime was that they took the head man's personal silver cup. So this was a cup that had a sacred uh, connection to it because it was a divining cup. Sacred. It was silver. It was personal, belonged to the head man, fit right in with his purposes because he wanted something that they could hide in Benjamin's bag, small, valuable, personal, sacred, it would make the charges against Benjamin all the more serious. So that's what they did. Uh, go get that, go get that cup, the divining cup. Verse, well, let me just stop there for a second. Because I know sometimes people ask about, well, what would Joseph be doing with a divining cup? Because divination of any kind is forbidden in the Scriptures. The the, the book of Deuteronomy is very clear, condemns uh, divining of any kind. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, and a chanter, a witch, a charmer, consulted with familiar spirits, a wizard, a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out for, from before thee. So what's the idea with uh, Joseph having a divination cup? To divine, by the way, means to foretell the future. The idea is that, A person who is a diviner 
will use some kind of an instrument, and uh, that instrument would enable them to peer into a person's future. We have lots of diviners in the New Orleans area. You go down in the French Quarter, there's somebody who will look into a crystal ball and tell you something about your future. Or somebody who will read your tarot cards, or they'll read your poem. That's all forms of divining. It's fortune-telling is what it amounts to. Uh, there are so many different ways people divine. Back when, when I was young, I remember people used to advertise that they would read your tea leaves, uh, where they would make tea in a cup, no filter, so that all the all the stuff though in the tea would, would be residue in the cup. And they would look at that and they would tell a person their future from it. In ancient times, people used bones. They would drop the bones of an animal. However, they felt they'd divine the future. Bones, coins, uh, what were some of the other things? Uh, sticks. Uh, you just about name it, they would, they would use it. Pendulums, Ouija board, all that's forms of divination, you know. Uh, the, uh, some of the oldest, I think the Bible even refers to some who divined by the flight of birds, you know, it was an occult practice. Uh, anyway, the Egyptians, one of the methods they used was a divining cup, special silver cup. They'd put water in it, sometimes drop dust in it, maybe drop, uh, gems, some kind of precious gems, maybe just a coin. They'd do something to make it ripple, and then they would read uh, a, a future or divine by the ripples and so forth in the, in the cup. You know, all forms of divining are condemned, right, in, in the Scriptures. They're all condemned. So uh, why would Joseph have such a cup? Well, I'm going to give you a few possibilities. Number one, maybe he didn't. Maybe this was just a silver cup. Remember, they were making a bogus charge against uh, Benjamin. Somebody's got my cup. Somebody took my cup. They wanted to make a point that it was a very precious, special, sacred cup. Make the charge more serious. Maybe it was just part of his tea set. Who knows? So it's possible that uh, it had nothing to do with divination whatsoever. The steward called it a divining cup, but... There's nothing in this passage that suggests Joseph practiced divination. Uh, the Egyptian nobility apparently were in possession of such cups, however, uh, and maybe, maybe Joseph's brothers would know that Egyptians had those kind of special sacred cups that would make the charge more serious to them. Fact is, Joseph, maybe he did own a divining cup, but that doesn't mean he was a diviner. Uh, or that he used it for divination. Look, Joseph was a godly man. God spoke to him. Why would he use Babylonian magic, Egyptian magic, to have to get the mind of the Lord? He wouldn't. That's uh, That much is obvious. But it suited its purpose. It was a silver cup. It was allegedly a divination cup, at least said, so said the uh, steward. And, uh, you know, later on when... Joseph speaks to them. He said, you don't think I can tell the future? So in verse 7, I think that's where we are. They said unto the steward, why says my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks mouths, we brought again to thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house, silver or gold. And then they make this foolish, very foolish charge or statement. He says, For whomsoever of thy servants it be found, whoever you find this with, let him die. Let him die and all the rest of us will become slaves. That's how confident they were that none of them stole that cup. Verse 10, he said, now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave. The rest of you will be held blameless. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. Now the search begins. And he searched. He began at the eldest. 
left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Oh, boy. This is not good. This is the worst case scenario. Then they rent their clothes. This shows you just how serious they knew this problem was. They rent, they tore their clothes. They laid at every man his donkey. They put all their stuff back on the donkeys and they returned to the city. Everybody's going back to Joseph's house. Of course, it wouldn't be a feast this time. They knew they were in trouble now. This is a very serious situation. Verse 14, And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was still there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that you have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Uh, the idea here is, did you think you could get away with this? Didn't you think? Didn't you think I'd find out? A man such as I, a man who is called, uh, you know, the man who reveals secrets. That was his name, right? His Egyptian name, the man who knows the secrets of God. You thought you could get away with this? Well, they knew they were in a world of trouble. Judah says, verse 16, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Judah has somehow become the spokesman for the group. Uh, he now shows responsibility and leadership. That We, we saw that also last week. But he mentioned something here that wouldn't make sense if he was only talking about the missing cup because Judah knew they didn't steal that cup. So he wouldn't be saying, look, we're guilty, we stole the cup. No, he's admitting guilt to something else. And again, it goes back to their betrayal of their own brother those 20-something years ago. He said, the Lord has found out the iniquity of thy servants. The Lord has revealed this. The Lord is calling us to account in all of this. And now it's time for the final exam. This would be a two part exam. Two questions. The final test. Two questions. 50% of the grade, each question. <laughs> so here was Joseph's two part test. He wanted to know. Now that the heat is turned all the way up and the consequences are so great, he wanted to know, how will they treat Benjamin now? And they also, he also wanted to know, he wanted to have this question answered, what consideration would they have for their father? Now, these are two important considerations because when they dealt with Joseph those 20 years previously, you know, they sold him out for 20 pieces of silver. Now, the consequences, what was at stake here, was far, far more valuable. When you think about it, they had been told they could all leave. They'd been told, take your grain, take your caravan, all of you can go. Just the, the young one who stole the cup, he stays here. The rest of you can go. Now look, that food, that caravan, that meant life not only for them, but for all of their family back home. The head man had just told them, you can go. That's a lot more than 20 pieces of silver, right? You can go. Go home. Your lives are safe. Leave. Leave your brother here. Go back to Egypt. What would they do? See, that was part of the test. Here's the other part of the test. What would be their attitude towards their father? Because, you know, when they sold Joseph into slavery, how it would affect their father didn't even enter their mind. Wasn't even a thought in their mind. They couldn't care less how it affected their father. In fact, they just wanted to be rid of Joseph. But you know what these verses say? Hey, verse 17, look with me over here. Verse 17. 
He said, God forbid I should do so. The man is whom hand the cup is found. He'll be my servant. As for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Get up, go home. You're all free to go. Now, here's the big test. Would they go and abandon Benjamin? Cut cut and run. Look, we hate to leave Benjamin, but we got to think of ourselves. We have to think of our family, our children. We have to think of them. We hate to leave Benjamin here, but it's just the way it's got to be. Cut our losses and go. Would they leave him in Egypt? And Judah, like I said, who has become spokesman for the group, he takes the remainder of this chapter and he asks for an audience with the head man. So, verse 18, Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. I know you're like Pharaoh himself. I'm just going to ask you, can I speak to you? Just will you listen to me just for a minute? This is his plea. This is his appeal. These verses record that conversation. He said, my Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. And you said unto your servants, Bring him down here to me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And you said to your servants, unless you bring your youngest brother down here with you, you'll see my face no more. That means you get no food. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. We told him what you said. And our father said, go again, buy us a little food. We told him we can't go if we don't bring Benjamin with us. But if you let him go with us, then we'll go down and we'll buy the food. And thy servant, verse 27, my father said unto us, you know that my wife bare me two sons. Now, you know, that was Rachel he's talking about. He's still, he's still showing extreme favoritism. My wife, Rachel, only gave me two sons. And those two, those were the apples of his eye. One went out from me, and I said, Surely he's torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if you take this also from me, and mischief befalls him, you'll bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, if we go back home and we don't have Benjamin with us, Verse 31, it shall come to pass when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray thee. Let thy servant abide instead of the lad. A bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go free. Let him go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father. Well, here's what Judah said. You're the, you're the big man here. Let me take my, brother, my little brother's place. Keep me as your slave. I couldn't bear the sight of seeing my father pine and die if we go back without my little brother. It would, I can't bear leaving him here, and I can't bear killing my father by leaving him here. Keep me. Now, you know what that means? A plus on his test. A plus, because number one, they didn't leave Egypt with all the grain and all the donkeys. When they were free to go, they didn't leave and go back. They stayed right there for Benjamin. So they learned, too. This is what Joseph realized. You know, these 20 years that we were gone away from each other, 
while God was teaching me and maturing me over here in Egypt, he was teaching and maturing and working on my brothers all the way back there in Canaan. Because just like I'm not the man I was, they're not the men that they were either. Now they were concerned about Benjamin and they were concerned about their father. A plus plus. They had changed. There had been a big change in their heart. When, you, when you're willing to offer this kind of self-sacrifice, let me be your slave. Let my brother go. There's been a change. When you're concerned about your father's welfare, whereas before they didn't give a thought to their father's welfare, now big change has taken place. Y'all with me so far? I want to remind you, these things were tests. These were tests. Joseph's brothers had changed. These were different men than the men from 20 years ago. He had put them through this series of tests, tested their character, tested their honesty, tested their faith, their sincerity, their humility. They were tempted and tried, and they passed. He tested the genuineness of their love for their brother and their genuineness of their love for their father, and they passed. Everything was now going to change. Now Joseph would be able to reveal himself to them, as we'll see in the next, next study. But I would like for us to consider today as... as we prepare uh, our hearts in just a few minutes for communion, I would like for us to consider the fact that, you know, we too are tested all the time. These brothers didn't know they were being tested. Questions were asked. They were being probed. They were being examined. They didn't know this was a test. All they knew is that they had miserably treated their brother years before. And had taken no thought about their father years before. They thought only of themselves. Now they saw Joseph was seeing selflessness in them. In particular in Judah. But I would say that we have to apply these things to our own lives. And let's recognize that we too are being tested all the time. You know what's being tested? Everything about us. Our character our integrity, our honesty, how will we act under certain circumstances? How will we react under certain circumstances? Will we be angry? Will we manifest pride and ego? Will, do, does our mouth have to just, do you have to keep running off at the mouth? All the time we are being probed, examined, and tested. Life is a test. Sometimes we do all right. Sometimes we fail utterly. No problem. You get to take it over. And over. And over. And even when you get it right, you get to take it over. Because we have to die daily. Remember Paul's confession? I die daily. I die daily. We die occasionally. Sometimes semi-occasional. <laughs> but the call for each of us is to be an overcomer. That means to be on the cross every day, every day. This self must die. This flesh must go to the cross. This self-will, this personal desire to, I don't know, for self-aggrandizement, for recognition, for being justified. We have to be the one who's found right. I have to be right. You have to admit it. <laughs> well, the good thing is that in all of our tests and trials and temptations, the Bible says God won't allow us to be tempted above what we're able to handle. 1 Corinthians 10.13, right? Amen. And one day we'll graduate from this life of tests. But as long as we are walking in a mortal body... On this planet, this fallen planet, every day is a test. Every day is a trial. 
Every day is a temptation. Through it all, we're to have joy, peace, worshiping the Lord, men and women of prayer. But let's remember all of these challenges that come our way, disappointments that come our way. It's more than just a little disappointment. It's a test. Because you know what's being probed here? Your affection for this world. You know, like the person whose their whole heart was in getting this particular thing. Maybe it was a, a car. Oh, I'm going to get that. That's my car. I'm getting that car. And then they sold it to somebody else. Are you devastated? Or can you say, you know what? There'll be another one. A better one. God's got something better for me. This world, look, it's not worth us getting all up in knots over. We trust the Lord. We're servants of God. We live for him each day. You be an overcomer. The Lord's with us. He gives us the grace we need to walk in victory. I die daily. That's Paul's confession. We need that to be ours. Lord, help us to die daily as well. In fact, Father, that's what we pray even now. Enable us to die daily. Die daily to self, to the flesh, to our independent self-will, to our ego, to our pride. Help us to die to these things, Lord. And help us to live, Lord Jesus, in such a way that you are honored and glorified. Help us to realize that, Lord, we are tested and examined and in so many things, in every area of our life, our character. Help us, Lord Jesus, to pass. As, as did our graduates this week, Lord, as they, as they graduated, Lord, we're looking to you that we might all graduate to glory, having passed the test and found faithful. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.